All right, welcome back. It's a full uh, Articulated Points episode for once. I know we've been away for a while doing just the shorter uh, Talking Point episodes, but I'm back. Patrick's back. Say hi, Pat. <laughs> hey, how's it going? It's it's good to see you. It does. Uh, it, it feels like maybe it's a, a good thing for the energy of the show that, you know, it's been a while since I've actually seen you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is nice to get a little play off each other that we can do when both of us are here as opposed to just, you know, talking to the camera. Absolutely, absolutely. Those other things are fun, but I absolutely love uh, sitting here and chatting with you. Yeah, I, I enjoy it too. Uh, and speaking of chatting, which <laughs> of course we're going to be doing that, uh, our topics tonight are going to be uh, G.I. Joe trading cards, um, a kind of obscure toy line called Blockman, and then finally a little bit of Star Wars with the Droid Factories. Um, should we just get right into it? Absolutely. There's plenty of cards across the history of G.I. Joe, so it can't, you know, we don't want to waste any time. Okay, so uh, for the purposes of today's talk, we're just going to focus on trading cards. Uh, I know there's things like uh, card games like Top Trumps or like these included sticker sets that came in the Loyal Subjects uh, vinyl figures. Um, we're not going to focus on those today, just, you know, so we can keep, uh, <laughs> keep from dawd dawdling on too long. So we're going to focus on the trading cards associated with G.I. Joe line and the... Uh, Real American Hero, more or less, and the uh, order they came out in. And uh, that means our first line we're going to be talking about are the 1986 Milton Bradley action cards. You can see my uh, my trusty big binder of uh, falling apartness, because <laughs> it's been so old. And uh, so the uh, action cards are weird in that they came carded. Like, they weren't sold in foil packs or anything, or plastic packs. They were paper packs. No, they were on cardboard backings with a plastic uh, bubble. And you got a couple cards per pack, and then you just had to keep buying them that way. It seems like a terrible waste of shelf space, though, by having to do that, because the backer card is probably the size of two uh, traditional trading card packs. And then you had to hang them from a hanger? Yeah, I kind of got the impression at the time that some of these Hasbro properties had taken off so much. I actually collected the Transformers ones when I was younger. And I did collect them on deep clearance, and there are quite a lot of them all the time. The fact that they came on a, a blister pack meant that you always knew what the, what the card on the outside was. So if you're trying to build a full set, I, I would imagine that there was not really any pattern as to which one appeared on the outside. So... You knew at least one card that you were getting each time, and then they came with some stickers, I believe, didn't they? Well, the Transformers ones came with stickers. Uh, no, these ones came with stickers, too. Um, okay. Actually, the same design as the pack in uh, Rub on Tattoos that you would get with the G.I. Joe figures. But since they're stickers, they're not reversed images, and you don't have to worry about the image fading or breaking apart. I actually prefer the stickers a lot better. <laughs> so, the action cards, 191 cards to the set. It's one of the larger ones. And, uh, again, while you always got the idea of what one of the cards was, there's still quite a few to go through. <laughs> you can see how thick that is with my, uh, single sets. Um, so it is half card art and half, uh, what do you call that, screenshots? Yeah, cartoon stills. Stills, there we go. Yeah, screenshots weren't exactly thing yet. <laughs> yeah, not not quite. Now, what I love about these is that, you know, it's the card art. It's clean. You don't have a figure coming up on the side, covering up part of it. You don't have torn cardboard behind it. This was, like, the one way as a kid you could get a good look at what that card was without having to buy the figure or, you know, razor blading off the bubble from the card and meticulously cataloging it on the way. Um... Not so great thing, the card backs. Well, by today's standards, they look pretty cheap. It's just black text on a white background. These do just recreate the file card text. So it's a nice way to do that. They take up less space in the file card. Um, and then when it comes to the vehicles, you got some of the stats off their blueprints. So it was a nice, it's a nice bit of reference, but uh, 
It would have been nice if we'd had a little bit of color on the back there too. Even trading cards at the time, you know, they might not have had a lot of color on the back, but they had, you know, two or three. One of the things that I like, and I, and I don't know, I, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder if I mention this. One of the things I particularly love about this set is some of the reference material that they were getting didn't quite seem to be always the finished reference material. I believe that there that at one point Torch is actually referred to as by his pre-production name on the back of one of the cards. Do you have that card handy? All right, so here's the card. It's uh, one of the cartoon stills, and on the back it says Dreadnought's Torch, Can Opener, and Nunchucka. So uh, they had some pre-production names for both Buzzer and River. Yeah, that's really interesting, and, and, and that's not the only spot inside these cards where you have pre-production material. Uh, you already kind of, when you were showing some of the cards off, you, you showed the Cobra Officer, and if you look at Cobra Officer in his card art there, his Cobra logo is actually red. And that's not how the figure was released, but that's definitely how the art was earlier on. So it's my guess that what happened is back then uh, Hasbro was taking some of this art that was being done by Hector Garrido, and, it, and it, it's a great thing that they managed to preserve it as well as they did by uh, taking high quality images and sending those off as transparencies to their various uh, licensees. These were actually released directly by Hasbro. I think I think the uh, release of them probably said, at the time, probably said Hasbro Bradley on the back of the package, I'm guessing. Um, and I, I know that, that Cobra Officer is in there. Could you pull up the Wolverine? I kind of want to take a look at CoverGirl yeah. on there. It actually is the uh, original CoverGirl art on there before they adjusted her head, too. I think so, yeah. Um, it's definitely a, a set that I would love to get. It's just always a little bit pricey because even now, the, the mere card count and how difficult it is to put a full set together makes it really not that cheap. I think that you can still find a lot of those still on the card whenever you do find them, and nobody wants to take those off the card in order to find out, uh, you know, what's inside there. It's all randomly packed. Yeah, so uh, I, I really still, I really should get on that and, and get myself a set of those. There's definitely... I should put myself to taking a look at that art and seeing what else I can find if anything else was changed. It'd be fun. Now, there's one other thing we could bring up for this. This is not an official product, but uh, this is a fan-made uh, card for Sightline, the uh, character that's sort of based off of uh, Gary Head, or Gary Goggles, as you might know him in the community, Jire Viper. This was produced by Joe Declassified and was uh, given out when they gave out their figures at the G.I. Joe Con. It's a nice little addition to your set. It kind of fits in. It's the stock, card stock a little bit different, but the fact that, you know, they're, they're putting out on the explosion with uh, some original character art, it is a nice little tribute. Uh, this is actually based off of the uh, figure that Declassified put out as well, so it's not based off the uh, 50th anniversary, uh, the one that Hasbro put out. Uh, yeah, a absolutely. If you are interested in any of that pre-production stuff, little tidbits like we even covered um, about the Dreadnoughts and things like that, that's the kind of stuff that you would just be inundated with if you showed up to one of the many conventions and make it to the Joe Declassified booth. There's just way too much to take in. Uh, so definitely, definitely look to do that if you see an appearance by Joe Declassified. The next set of trading cards that came out for G.I. Joe came out a little bit later in the 80s. It's around 1987, and it was produced by Comic Images, and that is their trading card set. Uh, now, this is actually kind of my least favorite of all the trading cards. Uh, there's 55 cards in the checklist. They came in this little uh, plastic trading card pack, but the thing I don't really like about it is that it's just reused Marvel art. And in some cases, redone Marvel art. Like somebody drew what they thought the Marvel art looked like. And it's certainly recolored. Certainly recolored, but like this one I am looking at right now of Hawk. Yeah, this one of ha Hawk. Yeah, it just doesn't look quite like it did on the comic book. I, I agree, these aren't quite my favorites. Um, the white borders to them along with, you know, again, they just have these white backgrounds. It's not that chipboard that you often see on like old Topps cards like on some of the old Star Wars ones, so they're a little bit nicer than that. But um, there's just something about them that I, I'm... It took me a long time, actually, to pick them up. I think that I bought the set 
for like 12 bucks two months ago just because we had been talking about uh, talking about the cards on articulated points and it, and it caused me to be interested in them but yeah still not my favorite and some of the things that kind of bug me about the card set in addition to you know the Marvel art not looking quite as nice as it did in the comics themselves is you know look at the spacing on this particular card where the border on one edge is significantly shorter than the border on the other and that just kind of you know riles my sense of symmetry and then it's a 55 card set so it's not exactly a small card set but it's not terribly large either and then you don't get a great variety of characters spotlighted like here's two different Zartan cards and they've got like two Serpentors and two Storm Shadows with the a line of comics and cartoons with as expansive a roster as G.I. Joe has, you'd think they'd try and spread around who they're showcasing in the cards. And yet, you know, we get doubles. I mean, they are different pieces of artwork for them, but, you know, we've seen a Zartan card. We can move on. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's a pretty fair assessment of these. As a G.I. Joe fan, you know, uh, the collect them all bug is certainly something that I have a problem with, so whenever I saw that they were cheap, I picked myself up some, but these are definitely not the first ones that I would arrive at. I think that the action cards from Hasbro were uh, a lot more fun, especially since they feature the card art that is just something that you need to have for archival purposes, almost. Uh, these, these just aren't as good. But thankfully, our next set is one of the highlights of the trading cards for G.I. Joe, and that is the Impel set. And uh, I think... When most people think of G.I. Joe trading cards, this is the, what they're thinking of, because this was everywhere in the 90s. I mean, they even had a TV commercial for it. I don't think I've ever seen a TV commercial for another licensed property. I don't even think I saw commercials for X-Men cards. No, you would think you would think that the Marvel Masterpieces would have had a commercial before these would have. And maybe they did, but I, I've, I've definitely never seen it. Uh, it was weird when you pointed out to me that there was a commercial for trading cards, but there definitely was a, a boom in uh, trading cards that were not were non-sports cards there in the 90s, and G.I. Joe was a big part of that. I, I actually started collecting G.I. Joe again in 1989, so these came out not that long after that. I think that people who collected from the beginning, or like in 1985 when our G.I. Joe was huge, have a tendency f to forget how popular G.I. Joe was in the 90s, which was after a lot of them, like, quit collecting G.I. Joe. But that was when I had gotten back into it, and you had, like, you know, it wasn't long before I, it wasn't long after I started collecting, or collecting again, that, like, the Deke cartoon came out, and these were, like, a huge part of my newfound enjoyment of G.I. Joe. Uh, so, yeah, as I've already shown off, it's got its own folder, a little binder. Artwork on it is very nice. Mine's not the greatest condition. It's got some tears on it, but these are actually pretty difficult to track down. So if you can get one at a decent price, jump on it. Uh, the cars themselves are actually pretty easy to come across. Like I said, it was everywhere. Everybody bought them. They came out around 1991. Uh, there's 200 cards in the set, so it's actually the largest trading card set, I think. I haven't quite done the math compared to the TCG game, but it's definitely up there. And uh, what I love about this line is that it is the first trading card set where you actually get original artwork. And uh, it's original artwork for, oh, probably about half the cards, at least, because part of that is them showing off the covers of the existing Marvel comics within the set. So it's just reusing that art. But... When it comes to showcasing individual characters or individual vehicles, new art done by Marvel artists. Uh, you can tell they were using the existing uh, character models that were showcased in the Order of Battle series because some of those character designs are straight out of there. Scarlet's, you know, pistol and hip belt, exactly like you'd see in that Herb Trimpey artwork. And that's the thing, this is a 1991 release, but they still acknowledge older characters. There's a whole section in these cards about the original team. It's not without fault though, um, there are quite a few miscolorations in here. 
that I think are kind of amusing. For instance, you get this card of Rock and Roll, who is very clearly in his 1982 uniform, but he is colored in his 1989 colors, complete with uh, camouflage added to the pants. This is not camouflage drawn in. You can actually see it just kind of smudged in there. I kind of wondered how much of that was miscolored or a decision to kind of promote the new colors versus maybe even trying to retcon some of the older looks rather than having all of those cards look exactly the same one character after the other. Well, not exactly the same. The 82 line did vary things up. But there, there was a little bit of... Um, it felt like they were trying to retcon the original... Cobra Soldier that was just called Cobra on its original package. It wasn't called Cobra Trooper, which is what people more refer to it now, uh, thanks to the 25th line, which was a good good way of uh, differentiating it from the Viper. But I believe that the card for Cobra Trooper actually says Viper on it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, actually, yeah. Um, which is a bit confusing, especially if you, you know, were trying to find a Viper figure back then. But... I think sometimes it's just errors, like, there's the the vamp here, it's colored like the vamp Mark II, but it's very clearly a yeah. Mark I vamp. Uh, it's 1991, I, I don't know if they were still mailing in vamp Mark II's at that point. I think that you still could get the vamp as a mail away that late, I'm pretty sure that it was still available. To counter your point about trying to push the more recent toys, here is the Sonic Fighters Viper card. And that's in the 1986 Viper colors. Yeah. So. Yeah, pretty strange. <laughs> that's most definitely an error in the wrong direction. One of the things that was really, really great about this card set at the time, uh, whenever I got back into G.I. Joe, it wasn't very long before I started talking with other collectors. And those collectors already were becoming aware of what waves were coming out. So even in the pre-talking everybody on the internet days, uh, the, the collecting community was kind of, um, had their finger on the pulse and knew what things were coming out and would talk with each other. But the cards were more exciting because you'd open up a pack of cards and a lot of times these things were showing you figures that had not been released yet. So I think in the case, it's my feeling anyway, that on these cards, in the case of like Rock and Roll, he was in his new colors because that was an 89 figure and this was 91. But somebody like Viper, that may not have had an actual uh, final color approval quite yet for Sonic Fighters whenever they started making these cards because some of the other 91 characters, um, they're not quite colored the way that they came out. Uh, especially the uh, 91 Snake Eyes card. He's in some, I think he's in his 89 colors is what yeah. the colors was basing it off of. But it actually makes for a pretty cool alternate look for that 91 Snake Eyes. I know some people don't like that one because he's blue and gray instead of all black. Well, that's what he would look like if he was all black. Yeah, it makes you want to pick up that uh, Street Fighter Guile figure and just make this figure right away, doesn't it? Night Fighter. Yeah, Night Fighter Guile. Uh, and because this card came out before Devil's Due Press or IDW existed, there's only the Marvel continuity to really base it off of for all these years. I mean, yes, the cartoon existed at the time, and the D cartoon was going on, but it was widely agreed that you know, Marvel is the default continuity in this case. So you even had cards that paid tribute to uh, fallen characters from the comics, and so, <laughs> complete with their own little medals on the back for the profiles. Oh, and that's another thing. They even got you know original artwork on the back of the cards too, full color as well. So a definite step up from the uh, action cards and the comic images. I was just going to say, it, it's really hard to uh, to focus right now because even just flipping through these cards, I, I just absolutely love them. Now, like I said, there were 200 cards in the set, and uh, so it was definitely a slog to try and track them down when you were a kid and you had to use your allowance or beg your mom to buy the cards for you and they only came in a small pack at a time. But nowadays, the cards are pretty easy to get off of eBay. You can even buy still sealed packs if you want. But there is still one more thing from this trading card set that is worth tracking down and is a little more difficult. Not as difficult necessarily as the folder, but it's kind of up there. And that is the checklist. For some reason, the checklist existed as cards, but they also made a paper checklist with its own little unique header and then a listing of all the cards. 
available on the set on one 8x11 page. Um, I'm not quite sure the story on this. Uh, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've actually looked at this, but I thought that if you had a brand new pack of cards, that on the back of that pack, it may have said something like, uh, you know, mail away for this, because that's how I got mine. I, I mailed away for mine. I don't actually have the folder that you do, which is, I, I'm, I'm jealous. I definitely want one of those. So back whenever I was, you know, a 14 year old or no, maybe I was 15 year old, year old. I actually took a picture of, of Magneto and did fan art of Serpentor for the cover of my binder because that's what I keep mine in. Looks pretty good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's, it's very, very old. Um, but yeah, I put the checklist on the back and a drawing on the front and that was my binder because I actually didn't even know about that the binder existed for a long time. Uh, you can even still find these cards. Like, I, I think a lot of times I see an entire box of them for like 10 or 15 bucks. Now, if you don't want to try and hunt them down on eBay, uh, and, you know, I can blame you, uh, I'm offering a little opportunity here for you to get your own set. It's, uh, it's been a little while since we've done a giveaway, but I figure, you know what, we've been away for a while, we're coming back, maybe this would be a good opportunity to try and uh, bribe you guys again, keep you, sort of thank you for sticking around. I have here 200 spare Impel base cards. Is that a full set? That is a full set. Yeah, takes two of these things. Okay, so they're not just like your triples or something. No, this is a full set. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to do that. That's awesome. I, I appreciate you doing that for somebody. So I think uh, we'll tell you at the end of the episode how to, to win these. So uh, stick around or, you know, jump the slider to the end. <laughs> <laughs> We're not your boss. Hopefully we'll have something good to say between now and signing up for the cards, but hey. I think so, but, you know, only you can judge us. <laughs> uh, now the next set of trading cards to come out is actually Impel again, and it's actually the same card art again, but in a much smaller, much harder to find set. These are colloquially known as the Gold Border cards, and uh, that should be pretty obvious why they're all <laughs> bordered in gold. Uh, gold ink, you know, it's not, you know, actual metal. Yes, they're not actual gilded cards. <laughs> they're not, they're not worth that much. <laughs> but uh, they are a bit pricey on the secondary market because these were only available packaged with G.I. Joe figures in uh, 1992, I believe. And it's a renumbered set of just 20. It does have a checklist. But all the cards were previously featured in the Impel set. They just have the new border on the front and the back. But because they were only available with figures, it's actually a bit of a prize to be able to get an entire set of these. And in fact, I had been actively searching for these for four years, and I only finished my set just last week. And I've, uh, you know, kind of casually been looking for them myself, and I already have five of them. <laughs> Woohoo! Quarter of the way there. <laughs> yeah, they're very difficult to find. Uh, it, it was kind of a nice promotion, because I think at the time, the cards had already been out for a while, so, you know, if you picked up a figure and you got that card in there, maybe you'd become interested in, in buying the regular retail packs of cards. Now, you can find these, like I said, on 1992 cards, but also, uh, Supersonic Fighters and uh, the 92 base uh, figures line. I don't know how many other pl places, I don't think you see them on DEF cards or anything. No, no, not that I recall. So it's actually pretty limited to where you can find them. And again, since they're all randomly packed in G.I. Joe's, you would ha really have to be uh, looking for what these cards were and even then they're behind some other offer inserts so you didn't necessarily see what the card was when you bought it so it's actually very hard to get as a kid to complete that set yeah they were they were at that point in the 90s they were already doing waves of figures uh you know back like in the 84 85 era you they were doing a series and the whole year was just considered one big series but by the time that that happened figures were kind of being introduced in waves and I believe that those probably were just available for a couple of months. Which I guess was the same same way in like 85. Like Triple Win was only 
around for a short period of time. But due to the fact that some of those sub teams were only coming out at certain times of the year, um, I, I think that that's, that's probably why you're seeing those on like Sonic Fighters and a few of the standard cards. If you think about it, each card probably cost you three or four dollars because you had to buy an action figure with it. So this was not a cheap set to a mass even back then. Yeah, unless you didn't have the figures. Uh, if you were really just a G.I. Joe collector trying to get trying to catch them all, um, it it was definitely difficult at the time, for sure. It's still difficult. They're, it's not an easy set to come by. Now the next series of trading cards were also figure pack-ins. Uh, this is called the Search and Destroy set, only because on the back it just sort of says underneath the G.I. Joe logo, Mission Search and Destroy. Uh, I don't know if there's actually an official title for this, but that seems as good as any. Uh, these, though, you'll notice are photographs. <laughs> they are based off the live-action commercials that were airing at the time from Griffin Bacall. It's a set of 20 that were available with figures, but then there was an extra four that were polybagged with the Marvel Comics at the time. Uh, that set of four actually is pretty common to find. Weirdly, you can still get a lot of those issues in the poly bag, but the uh, individual cards, not as easy to come by, but uh, available in 93 carded figures. I know Star Brigade, Armor Tech figures in particular were very easy to uh, find them with. Unlike the gold borders, you can usually make out what card it is behind the figure. I do love these cards because even today, our copies of those commercials are still pretty uh, not great. <laughs> there, uh, somebody's recording off of VHS that we then get transferred onto YouTube at who knows what resolution. So things are kind of fuzzy, details are lost. So even now, this is some of our best looks at what those uh, costumes look like, like the Mega Marines designs. This was when I was still buying toys, so this is a set that I started as a kid. So when I finally managed to finish it off after oof, 15 years, I was so excited and so happy to just be done with it. But uh, if you're persistent, these come up a bit more often, more frequently than the Gold Border Impel cards, so it is a little bit easier to complete this set. Uh, and I do think it's worth it, just to, again, see some of the wacky low-budget designs, like, what was that, the Cyber Viper there? <laughs> or, you know, Ninja Force in live action. It's just pressing all those right nostalgia buttons for me. Um, these are actually on like a premium card stock. The G.I. Joe logos are kind of an embossed uh, chrome gold. So it's, you know, it's basically taking the features of your higher end trading cards of that time and applying it to a figure packing. Yeah, I took the easy way out. I had a few of them uh, that I had gotten over the years, um, but I, I just ended up buying a set that somebody had put on eBay. They, you know, made a full set of them because I think that some people, you know, whenever they're buying figures, they just kind of amass them and uh, it's not that bad to put a full set of these together. I really like them though. They're, they're interesting. There's some minor variations though to some of them, aren't there? Yeah. Um, so apparently somehow promotionally we're given away uncut sheets of these cards where it's just, you know, one large kind of poster sized trading card that is comprised of all the uh, individual cards on the same stock. But these promotional ones had a different back on the design. Uh, normally, when you'd get one of these cards, the profile on the back would be a little bit of uh, flavor text on there and a sort of a graphical arrangement. The uh, promotional uncut sheet had an entirely different graphical design, no text uh, aside from the G.I. Joe name over and over again. But somehow, somehow those cards managed to slip out into the toys themselves. I have here on the front what look like identical cards, but when you flip them around, you'll see this back is very different. And this is actually one I got as a kid off of a card and toy. So they did manage to slip in there. Yeah, my uh, set that I bought a complete... Uh, the, the ones that I had as a kid, I don't think that I had any of those, but when I bought this complete set, it had one as well. Um, and since then, I think that we've seen a set of almost all of them. Uh, I can't remember if the checklist had one on the back of it, 
but it may have because I mean if you put that on the, the the checklist is actually on the back of the checklist card so if that's on the back that means that the checklist card doesn't have a checklist on it just has the GI Joe logo on one side so I don't know if that was one of them or not I can't quite remember from what we saw as we were looking at these um, but it's pretty much a, a full set is available both ways and then I saw an error card one year that as soon as I saw it I wanted to buy it but you know me being the honest guy I am I pointed out to the seller what he had and he didn't want to sell after I mentioned it but it was basically a card that was supposed to be in landscape orientation that had somehow been squeezed to fit in the portrait. It's not like they'd put the G.I. Joe logo sideways, they'd actually squeezed the picture and stretched it so that this would have been pulled upward and squeezed inward to fit on a vertical card shape. I don't know how that would happen, especially pre-digital days, I'm not sure, you know, it was 1993, they may have had a digital setup at that time, I don't know, but it still kind of boggles my mind how that happened and I really wanted to get that card. I'd really like to know, uh, going back, I'd really like to know what was on the back of that card, whether or not it was the text or just that, you know, generic uh, background that we've seen that is, is, seems to be the rarer of the two. I believe it was the text. I did look at that. That is, that, that's just extra strange. Because if it was an error card that was, had that, that earlier, what may be the earlier back to it, uh, that would kind of make sense to me. But the fact that it's an error card, it's such a weird error. It's not like, you know, some letters are different. It's, I, I don't know, to me, it, it just makes for a, a richer collecting experience whenever there's such a thing to hunt down. So the next year was uh, 1994, obviously, follows on from 93. Makes sense. But uh, that year was also the 30th anniversary of G.I. Joe in general. So Hasbro kind of rolled out a whole campaign that year called the 30th Salute. And, you know, you could get a watch with 30th Salute, you can get a uh, collector's guidebook with 30th Salute, the uh, was it the Intrepid Convention sort of themed around 30th Salute? 94, right? Yes. And also, a trading card set, 30th Salute. This one was actually also done by Comic Images, but boy, what the difference seven years can make, because it is uh, worlds apart from that first card set they put out. This one actually uh, spans the entire history of G.I. Joe to that point. So, your first cards showcasing original 1960s G.I. Joes up through Adventure Team. Even a little bit of Super Joe in there before we get into the 80s incarnation and showing off what uh, became the dominant toy line for Hasbro before getting into, you know, unproduced and international figures. Clearly a guy like me who's been, you know, <laughs> archiving G.I. Joe's as a hobby for 13 years now. This, uh, this tickles my fancy. So the base set ends at 90 cards, but there's an additional 12 trading cards on top of that, plus something I'm not even quite sure how to qual qualify, but you have your six chromed 12-inch figure cards, your three, they call it a comic anthology subset, these are uh, all chase cards, none of them mentioned on the checklist at all. You have your one promotional card, definitely a card to add to the set, sort of a uh, number zero if you want. There's a limited edition medallion card of the G.I. Joe Nurse. I wasn't even aware this thing existed because at the time that I found it, it wasn't on Yojo. And then probably the hardest individual card to get in this set is the... Uh, signed Sergeant Savage Dynamite card. It is actually signed by Joe Kubert up in the corner and there is only 500 of these produced and they're all actual signed cards. It's not like it was a auto pen or anything. Yeah, this uh, set actually had me confused for a long time because when I was looking up cards and you know people would refer to the comic images set, I thought that they meant this set. Usually people just refer to this as the 30th and the other comic images set as the comic images set, which can be a little bit confusing. Uh, but this set definitely seems to be, 
you know, an interesting indication of, of where the G.I. Joe brand was at the time, later in the 90s. We definitely were, uh, you know, there, were, there was new stuff coming out. It has that great Kubert art for Sergeant Savage, which was still kind of an up-and-coming thing at the time. But then there's also kind of a celebration of how far-reaching and um, where the brand has gone over 30 years, which it, it's interesting to me how this, this feels a lot more like what you would see at a G.I. Joe convention, like the, the various flavors of G.I. Joe that you would get, rather than the very snapshot feeling that the other cards have had done up to this point. When you think about it, it's also sort of unintentionally highlighting a brand in transition. With the little sneak peek of Sergeant Savage at the end, in hindsight, you know it's kind of, you know, the end of three and three quarter inch vintage Joes as we knew it. Sure, they'd come back in a few years with the Toys R Us sets, but they weren't the same. They weren't quite the same at, at that point anymore. That initial 12 year run was over and done with. And though it's, you know, showing off unproduced stuff, international stuff, it's also kind of the swan song for that vintage three and three quarter inch line. It's interesting how it, it gave uh, the general population that maybe hadn't gone to G.I. Joe conventions, were not looking in uh, toy magazines. You may not have an idea about some of this international stuff and all the various things that exist of G.I. Joe. And if you picked up some of these cards, you know, it, it really would whet your appetite just before there was time for everything to just shut down. Now, there's actually still one other thing I haven't mentioned about this set, um, and that is this. It's called an uncut six-card strip, but I think that's a bit of a misnomer because if you look on the back of it, there's no way that cleanly cuts into six cards. So this is uh, purely a promotional chase item. Uh, it said it was, what, one per box that this came in? So I think... Uh, it was probably lining the box, the bottom of the box that all the card packs came in. I, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, this is actually a bit harder to track down from the line. I'm, it's probably up there with the uh, the dynamite card in rarity, and trying to find this card because uh, I have obviously I haven't looked for one in a while since I have it, but I don't see them come up all that often. And. Uh, I also should add, uh, in terms of the rarity of this whole set, the 90 card base set is probably uh, only second to Impel and how common is found on eBay. Okay, moving on. Uh, that was definitely not the last of G.I. Joe collectible cards. It goes on and on, and, and Phil's been there the whole, the whole time. So take us to the next set. Our next set brings us to uh, 2004. We're jumping ahead a decade. And uh, this is the G.I. Joe TCG. Now, it's a trading card game, so, you know, that still fits within our purview here tonight. <laughs> the word trading card is in there. We left out the top trumps because they're just a game that's cards, but they actually say that they're trading cards, so they count. That's right. Um, you can see this is also a pretty large set uh, on par with the Impel cards, and uh, it's definitely more common to see the base cards out there because they're one of the more recent trading cards for G.I. Joe, but it's also got induced rarity within it, as all trading card games do. Thank you, Magic, for that. That's why I don't have a complete set of these either. And uh, completing this set can actually get kind of pricey when you're getting back to, the, to those uh, rares and uncommons and the hollow foils. It is nice, though, because even though it came out in 2004, and the art is definitely by the Devil's Due Press people, uh, they don't shy away from going back to the 80s. So you'll get characters brought up there that weren't seen in decades, like uh, like Muskrat. Muskrat, I don't think I ever showed up in the Image Comics at that point. I can't. If he did, I can't remember. Probably on that assault on Cobra Island. But here he is. He's in his 80s costume. I love it. They're, they're doing deep dives. You get, you know, Roadblock in his Valor vs. Venom Walmart uh, exclusive release in that desert camo. If you got a starter deck, there were two ex exclusive cards in there. If you bought Valor vs. Venom on DVD or VHS, there's an exclusive Venomous Maximus card in there. So you kind of had to jump around 
to get every card available. And then you had your Armored Strike expansion, which, uh, because this card line was killed so early on, there really is only the one expansion. So thankfully, that only adds an extra uh, 78 cards to your, to your deck. Only an extra 78. Only. On top of your 114 base card set. Alright, so no, it isn't, uh, is, is just shy of uh, Impel's number. If they'd only gotten out another expansion set. If only. There's still time. Hey, you know, expansion sets are expansion sets, right? Hasbro still owns Wizards of the Coast. They can make it happen. Yep. This one will definitely take some time to acquire and accumulate. You'll get tons of, uh, of commons and uncommons. But, you know. The uh, way I started, I bought actual boxes of starter decks and then a uh, regular base deck and then the Armored Strike. I bought full boxes of those. They weren't too expensive when I did it, but that was about 10 years ago now. Yeah, I think as far as trading card games go, the game mechanics were relatively simple. It definitely wasn't that complex, but um, I think they just wouldn't want to scare off uh, the G.I. Joe collectors with a ridiculously difficult game to play. So it seemed to be one of Wizards of the Coast's more entry-level trading card games, which I don't know if that was a help or a hindrance, but it is what it is, it's been a long time, and, you know, why not just collect them as collectible cards at this point? Then we, uh, we jump forward another nine years to 2013, and I bet you didn't know that G.I. Joe Retaliation had trading cards. I enjoyed G.I. Joe Retaliation. Uh, I really liked these cards. I knew somebody would put a set together and that I could just buy a full set. It didn't seem to make sense for me to battle uh, opening up card pack after card pack. So I picked up one set whenever I was at Dollar Tree at one point, and then after that, um, you know, I, I just went online and, and bought myself one that somebody had put together. Probably the way to go. I think I bought a bunch of packs online too, and then ended up trading with some people to uh, finish off my set. Uh, these cards were put out by Enterplay. There is a checklist for it, but the checklist has only ever existed as a PDF. So you actually have to print out your own copy. There's 48 cards in the set and six temporary tattoos. You got one randomly packed with every trading card pack. So you'd get a bunch of uh, those same tattoos over and over again. Uh, what I do love, though, is that it kind of highlights some of those... Well, obviously it highlights the main cast, but then it'll bring in characters like uh, Clutch. <laughs> so those characters who only appeared in the very beginning before everybody gets killed off, they did have names. It is nice to know they were meant to be established characters. Um, the last nine cards in the numbering is called the puzzle set, because on the back of it, you can kind of put together the poster. A little neat little gimmick there. Um, so it's not a very big set, obviously, but uh, not too expensive to acquire either, so it's probably a nice entry-level trading card set. For what it is, it's a good set. Uh, the fact that it includes images of those characters, I think, is is really the key feature of them at this point. Yeah, definitely. That was uh, one of my main draws to it. What else do you have for us on cards? So, this will bring me to our last official trading card set. This one is probably the most difficult set to acquire, but also the most haphazardly put together set, and the ones that are... I'm just going to say, these are the trading cards sets that were put out by the G.I. Joe Club. Um, as we're recording this, this is actually their last day that they would take orders, so the store is shut down in uh, two hours, two and a half hours ago. <laughs> so, uh, they... For every year of their convention starting, I'm not sure, I know it goes back to at least 2012, I'm sure it goes back further than that, they would put out a set of trading cards, like this. The main purpose of these were if you did not want to buy exclusive toys, but you did want to meet the guests they have, they'd have you'd have something for them to sign. So, like, there's Larry Hama or Kirk Bazigian. Firefly is there because it would have been Greg Berger who voiced Firefly. And then you've got a blank one for when you've got a comic book artist to do a little sketch. So that's the point of these. Uh, annoyingly, you would get 
10 cards at a time, but they always made sure that there were two chase cards, so you'd have to buy two sets to get both chase cards. And there was never enough sets produced for everyone to get. That was always usually one of the first things to sell out was the trading card sets. It annoyed me to no end, so I have nowhere close to a full set of these. And then they do stuff like uncut sheets and viewing even like uncut sheets of the chase cards. These things aren't numbered either. And I, again, I don't know how far back it goes. And even, you know, if you were a golden ticket holder, you'd get sort of your own version of the trading cards as an uncut sheet. So it's kind of impossible to, uh, to keep track of what was available. But I know several years worth were out there. Yeah, it's almost like we need an archive of the, uh, the order form for the souvenirs. That probably would be the best way of going about it, and maybe that's something the G.I. Joe community needs to work on together, is trying to, to archive all those so that we can look back at all that old club stuff and, and see exactly what was out there. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering how much longer we have for the club website to be up, but I don't think the club website even mentions these. No, um, the ones I got, I got off of their sale, but even then, you know, there wasn't exactly a, a robust guide of what was available. Um, I actually have kept the order forms for the conventions I went to, but obviously I haven't gone to every convention. So the ones I haven't been to, I don't know about. And even the ones I have been, they sold out sometimes before I could get to them, so I didn't get those years, and I don't know what's available on those either. Again, you probably wouldn't even really trade these ones because you'd buy a set and have them. At best, you'd have an extra nine base cards. Right, right. So sometimes they do pop up on eBay. Um, not the cheapest when they do, but it's also very random when it does happen. And the club would usually sell them in those pages too. I know that whenever I bought some, uh, they were included inside those sheets. It wasn't like you were opening up a pack of cards and then looking through it. It was actually on one of those binder sheets. And that takes us to the end of the G.I. Joe trading cards. Um, there's a bunch of different lines out there. Some of them are easier to collect than others. All of them pretty good in their own way. <laughs> Except for maybe that first comic image is said, I don't know, there's a bit of a charm to it too. Uh, let us know what you think. Anything you have, anything we missed? Okay, thanks. That really uh, covers a lot of trading cards. Um, I, I definitely have a lot of collecting still to do apparently. Uh, but I wanted to talk about something that... How do I put this? I collect a lot of various toys. <laughs> One of those things that that really interests me obviously is Transformers and something that I almost pride myself on is whenever you just become really interested in a toy and then you find out that creatively it's related to other things that you love it just kind of tells me that there's something inherently about the creativity of the people who are behind it that is there in all of their work and it stands out and makes you love it regardless of where you heard about it uh, what the marketing behind it may be, and uh, where else it may have come from. One of those things that I really love is Blockman. I, I guess you could tell from the title, Blockman. It's a man <laughs> who is a block, essentially. They are made by Takara, and the way that I found out about these, I guess I could back up and just kind of tell things from my exposure to them. A long time ago, and I can even remember walking out of Transformers the movie and going to a store, a department store, right across the plaza from Transformers the movie, and there was a machine from Diamond Distribution where you'd put in your, you know, it was like a, a vending machine. You'd put in your quarter, I think it was a quarter, and, and twist it, and there would be a, a capsule, and you'd open it up, and inside what I, what I found were these. This one is actually two capsule sets. I kind of want to make that clear that this is not one. There would be, one, for one thing, you'd get the white parts, which are actually a little guy, and then you'd get the add-on parts in another set. So I really was crazy about that machine, <laughs> and every time we went to that store, I asked for another one, and I got a lot of them, but like I said, you were only getting like little bits of, of a kit at a time. Um, so I got that one, which is like a, he turns into a race car. 
I have this other one where it is a jet and they're really cool just like the design of them is, is fun there's a little there's a cockpit and all these parts come off uh, some of the other ones that you could get here's one where the figure the main base figure is yellow and then there are armored pieces that you can put on him including like a backpack and a shield and a really awesome gun uh, but at the time I just thought that this was something that I that I loved and that I knew about and that there was nothing more to this. It turns out that these were actually based on a toy line that was being made by Takara. So related to Transformers. My, my love of Transformers and robots at the time brought me to this. But apparently it was a toy line released between 1984 and 1985, originally in Japan. And they ended up being released in the United States but I don't really quite understand why. We, we've covered Chroniform and, and Diaclone and Diacron in, in an earlier episode. I don't really understand why Takara didn't release them in one of the various avenues that they had tried for U.S. release. Instead, they were released in the Robotech toy line, which is very strange. Uh, they were released by Revell as Robo Links. So inside a set, you would get a few of these figures along with some of the parts. Let me kind of show you the difference in size. Here's one of the Robo Links that is almost an equivalent of what I was getting out of the vending machine. So they're not quite the same. Uh, <laughs> the vending machine ones are actually really, really hard to find now because uh, they, I, I don't remember them having a name on them. I know that, I'm sure I didn't throw it away, so it's one of those things that I've looked for, but I can't find it. Inside each capsule, you'd also get a catalog that showed a whole bunch of the figures just all combined together, making one huge robot, and I just dreamed, oh man, one day I will be able to build that robot, but if I had bought every single one in the machine, I, I doubt that all the parts were even in there, or in the quantity that I would have needed to do that. It's quite a racket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and the sad thing is, I never saw another machine. The one that was at that store, it was a store called Treasure Island. And all of the capsules had a diamond distribution logo on the bottom of them. So I, I think that they had relatively decent distribution in the United States, or I would imagine that they did. But it seems to be the only place that anyone can find them. Um, so, just to kind of cover what this toy line was about, uh, let me see if I can, if I can explain it simply. Um, Blockman had several different series everything was classified in. There was Series A, which was the armor upgrade series. That would be something like this that you're looking at here. Series B, that would be the basic type series. It never came out. <laughs> Series C was the combining series and is the meat and potatoes of this toy line and the entire reason why I'm talking about it now and because I love it. So I'll get more into that in a second. Combining series, obviously, it's, it's almost the Transformers equivalent of this toy line. Uh, series D was a motor series. It was also canceled. Uh, <laughs> but it came out in the United States. How about that? What a twist. I know, it's a huge twist. Uh, series E was an electronic battery series that never ended up happening. Series F was, uh, I believe, a fortress series that never happened. And series, and I don't even know where all this information is coming from, to be honest, because I've looked this up at various websites. You can look this up at uh, microforever.com and there's a, a guy on, on Facebook that I will definitely plug here. His name's James Collett. He's an Australian gentleman, and he has a website called Blockman Link. That if you're interested in these at all, why have you not already been there? Or definitely go there <laughs> after we're done talking. Because after, after we're done. After we're, after we're done. <laughs> don't, don't shut us off and go there now. Um, <laughs> but he covers everything. Uh, some of the sets... You know, he gives you a breakdown of, of everything that's inside of them. But uh, Series G, he covers on there. I did not know about them. Series G is the set that came out in Japan, but not the United States. 
It's the biomechanical series where basically a bunch of these are put together to look like two different dinosaurs. The way that these blocks work is there's various five millimeter ports and, it, and by that time five millimeters had become almost a standard because Microman had been using it since uh, the mid 70s and Transformers used it. It's still in use. Um, the Transformers Siege line uses five millimeter ports. So yes, these are compatible with Transformers Siege. I can even show you that in a second. Um, but the five millimeter ports would be on the shoulder and then there's a, a peg on the leg as well as a hole on the leg and then the backs also had a hole and a peg and another hole and then a hole on the bottom three holes on the bottom of the feet and his head is even a five millimeter port so you could put these figures together almost any which way and come up with different configurations they will even lock together side by side so you can lock the uh, shoulders in with with the legs or lock the shoulders in with the legs that direction. They just fit various ways that whenever you put them together, they're really, really sturdy. Um, you would think that because the legs here split in half, that that peg, the hole that's in the bottom would not be sturdy, but that's just not true because the way that they've designed the shoulders with those side things that go up, you can actually peg these things together and that kind of holds the legs in so now those spots that where his legs normally would have bent they're just held right in there and you could just build huge things out of these I think that I'm pretty sure that on the Blockman Link Facebook group there's a picture from an old toy convention where Takara had like a few hundred of these things linked together it's almost like robot Legos <laughs> yeah they're really really cool um but th those are the basic series. Series A that came out in the United States as Force 20, 21, and 22. And in those you would get like the armor and you would get the uh, ability to turn it into a jet. So those are like the basic ones where you're basically just getting one figure and some parts to put on him. So you weren't getting like multiple figures to put the figures together as blocks in those basic sets. It just was the very, very most basic entry level you could get. Like I said earlier, uh, the, the C series, the combining series, which is Force, the, the Force 30, 31, and 32 in the United States, as well as Force 40, 41, and 42, uh, those were the meat and potatoes. Here is, for example, Force 41. I had no intention of buying these in the box whenever I found out about them. I just kind of ended up doing that because it was the most cost-effective way of getting a full set. This is Force 41, and it has on it, on the back, the, the other convenience of this is that the back of the box shows you various configurations that you can make out of the set. But then it also has a checklist to tell you everything that should be in there. But if you will look at the Blockman Link website, they kind of let you know that sometimes that information that was on the back wasn't always completely accurate so you kind of still need to go to their website and make sure that you have the lists com you know as complete as possible there's a couple pieces that are missing and i think a couple of the guns that are are switched between sets on the back of the box on the website they're correct um but they're a lot of fun you could basically build various things out of them and they had these little drivers that they came with which really isn't unlike diaclone and it confuses me because these weren't released as diaclone in japan thinking through the the time frame of when these were released uh 1984 to 85 is when these were released as Blockman in japan and in 1984 transformers came out in the united states 1985 Transformers came out in Japan. So in 1984, in, in, as far as Takara Japan goes, you were still getting some Diaclone releases. These weren't released as Diaclone over there, although I kind of think that they could have been. They definitely came with figures roughly that size. And all of this stuff, I think that we covered Diaclone and, and uh, Microman relatively okay in previous episodes. 
they kind of are referred to as Takara's SF Land. I looked through this SF Land book just before we started recording, trying to find the Blockman section, and I couldn't find it. I don't recall it even being in here. So these are kind of almost a footnote of all the Takara stuff that came out. Uh, Force 40, 41, and 42 are by far my favorite because they are the ones that you could use to make figures. Figures out of figures. Yes, well, it, it's almost like the, it has a transformer thing going on because obviously you could build a, a out, out of the small figure, you could build a bigger vehicle, and then you could also build a figure. Uh, because the cockpit that, that's inside of here, this is a standard center cockpit piece. It opens up, and you could put your block man figure inside of this. Personally, I, I would prefer to put a Diaclone driver inside of this. But the cool thing is, on the back of this, where, you know, you'd make your, your ship, on the back it actually has this slider. You slide up and have this awesome robot face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's styled exactly like a vintage Transformer, so I, I genuinely love it. This is what got me excited. Whenever I had that initial little insert catalog, though, it wasn't one of these. It was actually all three. Huh. <laughs> yeah. 40, 41, and 42 are, in my opinion, the best ones because this is the cockpit that comes with that one, and here is the... that is the head for the figure for Force 42. However, Force 41, 40, 41, and 42 can then also be combined together, I hope I'm making sense, to make an even larger guy, at which point you put the head up to make it even bigger. Do these really fall under a transforming toy or do they fall under a Lego toy? They aren't like Creo, that's for sure. <laughs> so. That's kind of like a robot Lego to me, um, but you definitely had the the building block kind of concept going on with these. So, tons and tons of fun. I love them. Let me see if there's anything else that I, I wanted to mention. Oh, I wanted to show it with some of these. Here, for example, is a Blockman figure with a little jetpack that I put on him. As you do. Oh yeah, I love jetpacks. I put jetpacks on everything. Five millimeter system. Yeah, it, if his five millimeter connector at his waist would hold together, you could see that the uh, <laughs> that the five millimeter connector from you know 1985 is actually plugging directly into his arm. There, it's awesome. These figures. Math. Right, math. One of the interesting things that actually made Philip say, "Hey, maybe we should talk about that on the show." is this. I think it's Force 40 and 41. They include this part. And I started looking at this and thought, you know what, that looks kind of familiar to me. And here's a, a junker of thrust, and naturally it's five millimeters, so you could put that in there. But whenever I did, it occurred to me that that almost looks more like the Null Ray on Starscream than the ones that actually came with the toy. Uh, it has this point that sticks up here as well as these wings and that's definitely something that you kind of see on some of the animation models. So I kind of wonder if whenever they were designing the animation models if maybe they had some Blockman parts sitting nearby. Mixed in with it. <laughs> I also would like to note that Force 42, one of the three sets that I'm going crazy about right now, 40, 41, and 42, included these launchers, which don't look that unlike the launchers that came on Ultra Magnus. They have that pig in the back, and they have pigs on the side, which isn't quite the same. But the interesting thing is if you go back to the original Diaclone catalog that depicts a prototype of that version of Convoy, these actually are what's on the shoulders. It's Blockman parts that are on the Transformer. Well, that are on the Diaclone toy. Powered convoy. It, it just makes me think that 
all this stuff was intermingling, and it wouldn't be a surprise if that actually is the reason that Starscream's Null Rays look the way that they do in the cartoon. It does uh, seem to put pieces of the puzzle in play, doesn't it? All the uh, different toy lines that were sort of co-mingling over at Hasbro. Absolutely. Here's a, I might as well just show this off while I have it. Here is Force 50. Uh, Force 50 is nice. It comes with this huge gun. Bet that wouldn't pass toy safety laws today. Well, it doesn't launch anything, so it'll probably be okay. Oh, well. Uh, but this is the motorized series that didn't come out in Japan. And a lot of times you do see the parts to these mixed in with Transformers, and it's like, well, this fist looks like it belongs to a Transformer, but it doesn't. It's just designed by the same people. I mean, I guess it. I guess you could argue that it turns into a robot, but it doesn't have that nice robotic Takara-looking head like the Force 40, 41, and 42. And so that's why I kind of go crazy about those. And it was such a dream come true when I realized these robots that I was getting out of that vending machine were actually something that I could have if I had known at the time, seen on the shelf, and then maybe begged for it and gotten 40, 41, and 42, and built that gigantic robot that was inside that catalog. I have built it. The more we talk about our stories of kids of our childhoods and things we hadn't known about at the time, the more I'm sure our parents are grateful the internet didn't exist back then. That's absolutely true, because these were would have been something I would have, I would have begged for these for sure. It would have been bad. It would have been bad. <laughs> Takara SF Land, it's definitely some interesting stuff. I, I absolutely love it. Well, I can see that from the way you just, you're just spouting your enthusiasm for these things. It's coming through. Anyway, uh, I guess we probably should move on from there. We talked a lot about cards, and I, I spouted off about tiny little robots again. Um, but uh, what, what else do we have? We have some other things to cover. Well, speaking of robots, uh, we should probably head to a galaxy far, far away and talk about some uh, robots over there. I, I think you got to, to head to a galaxy far, far away. I haven't gotten to go there yet. I may have been to a little place called Galaxy's Edge, and I may have made a uh, talking point video about it, yes. I recall, yes. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about droid factories. And... Uh, while this will actually cover uh, Disney Parks in a minute, we're going to start back in uh, 1978 with the Kenner Droid Factory, sort of the uh, genesis of all of this. Boy, you just love those 1970s Earth tones, don't you? <laughs> this is a toy released by Kenner in the original vintage Star Wars line. It's pretty much a crane, a... Uh, base plate and a bunch of random robot parts that don't necessarily fit the Star Wars aesthetic as we know now, but when we only had the one movie at the time, it allowed uh, Kenner sculptors to uh, brainstorm a little bit more about what they thought would be just off panel. Uh, so what's great about this set is uh, it really was about the child's imagination. I mean, you can build some predetermined builds, but there's really a lot of free play options. You've got some really weirdly uh, shaped base bodies that you could then take these tiny little uh, PVC pegs and start attaching parts to until you got something resembling a robot. And then you can build your own droid. Now, uh, what made me want to buy this set when I was starting out buying vintage Star Wars figures is that this is the only place where you can get a vintage R2-D2 with a third leg. I actually had this set as a child. Uh, it was it had tons of play value. It, it's exactly like you said. There's They were kind of doing an expanded universe thing, and it was smart to go that direction. I kind of think that the whole set was built around R2-D2, it seems. Um, the droids didn't all quite look like that. Obviously, there's no parts to build a C-3PO, nor are there any parts to build a golden robot. Everything is kind of colored so that everything will fit 
relatively seamlessly with parts that you may pull off of R2-D2 or want to put on to R2-D2 or Astromech R2 parts. They're all that, that same white base color. I remember that the way that I would usually play with it, which is what I think was intended, is it came with some orange hoses and a lot of the parts had like little pegs where you could attach each end of the hose and then that crane arm with a boom you could just pick them up and hook the parts over and carry them over to the platform, drop them off, and you'd basically pick your parts out that you were going to build your droid with, lay them on there, and then assemble them. At least that's how, in, in my mind, that it worked. Whenever Jawas weren't busy, you know, scouring the desert for droids to steal and sell, they were scouring the desert for scrap droid parts to take back to their factory that was somewhere and, and put them together. And here is the uh, R2-D2 you can build with the droid factory set. This is uh, your first buildable astromech droid, which is a concept that has since taken on a life of its own, but uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. But one thing I think is interesting is that this set doesn't, aside from the R2, it doesn't feel terribly Star Wars to me. Uh, it feels more weirdly generic 70s sci-fi. Um, you know the vibe, sort of like Logan's Run or other sci-fi films of the 70s where the future is white plastic. <laughs> Everything is white. Or you've got your earth tones for other 70s. It's, it feels less like Star Wars. And I know Star Wars has some of that. Uh, Tantive 4 with its white walls. But I just, you know... White walls and clear plastic domes is the vision I get for 1970s sci-fi aesthetic. Absolutely. I see where you're, where you're going with that, and it's interesting because I never look at this set and think anything but Star Wars because, you know, it was part of Star Wars as I grew up with it. You know, this set came out really early on, and I think that the color of the set does kind of evoke a feeling of, of Tatooine. Um, but you're right that the robots don't necessarily do that, but they do kind of match the color of the X-Wing within the Kenner toy line, which really doesn't look like the same color as an X-Wing did in the movie. So I think that you just or get... the TIE Fighter. And the TIE Fighter, yeah. So I think that you just kind of get that a little bit with that, with that earlier Kenner stuff. Eventually they would change some of the colors up and match the movie a little bit more with some grays, but I, I think that really what, what it was was a lot of that that 70s sci-fi mindset affected how the whole toy line looked to some degree. Um, but, but for me, yeah, I, I totally, I totally get like a, a, um, almost a, the, the full nostalgic vibe of vintage Star Wars comes across to me whenever I look at that set. I imagine the uh, Kenner designers are pulling from a lot of, uh, influences when designing this because it's, you know it is early expanded universe the, the rules of star wars as such weren't exactly set something i have here behind me um is also from the vintage star wars line it is jabba's well maybe i should move, move this stuff from it it's jabba's dungeon this was a sears exclusive and it is a retool of the uh droid factory but it's a heavy retool this entire area in here was all changed well not not entirely this this part that holds that one droid piece up is still there but it's kind of nondescript as it is but there aren't like all the slots and spots to put everything in it's interesting kenner was definitely known for reusing some of their older tooling and they certainly did a nice job with this one because it makes for a nice backdrop uh java's dungeon obviously was something that was kind of there in the movie. I don't, I don't think that you can possibly actually reach the boom down. And this doesn't, I don't know, I guess maybe you could put a droid here and, and torture him by having a power droid there. I, I really don't know how you would have played with this as a kid. I didn't have it as a kid. This is the one I think that was released in the Return of the Jedi box in gray. And then I believe that they did this base of it later on in like a brown or tan with a Power of the Force box. So the instructions even were changed to reflect Power of the Force figures. 
There's a spot up here at the front for uh, foot pegs to display a few figures right there. It's really creative that some of the things that they came up with. One of the things that I thought was interesting, just from a manufacturing standpoint, is you have right here where the injection point is on the plastic, and then <laughs> instead of creating something incredibly detailed on the opposite side of that, they have like this little smelting pool or pot here. Hmm. So basically, in case the thing doesn't completely fill, or if it's a little misshapen, that's okay, because <laughs> it's not an area of great detail anyway. Uh, so I thought that was really creative, and I think on the, on the Droid Factory set, R2-D2's head goes in that spot and kind of covers up any imperfections that may be caused by that injection point. Actually, it's his body that goes there, not the head. His body goes there? Yeah. Okay. Well, they definitely did a nice job with it. You talked about how there's a leftover part uh, for one of the blocks up front. I can tell you, I didn't have this as a kid, but... If I were to see something like that, that's the kind of thing that would have driven me nuts, trying to figure out what the point of that was, and not knowing it was a legacy leftover tooling. Yeah, I'd really like to see it, more of a behind-the-scenes of, of the thought process that went into this. Um, and did they redo the original tooling? Like, this is a lot of changes to make. Or did they actually make a new mold for this? I, I really don't know. Uh, but it would be interesting to find out, because it's so drastically... It's so the same on this side... Even with the spot where I used to put my little Jawa for him to to draw droids up over onto or parts over on here, and then they'd roll off this direction, it's so much the same all around. But then this area, all in here, is so so different. Uh, but with the same crane arm, and then they've just added this little additional piece that hooks on that has uh, it looks like what they torture the power droid with inside Jawa's dungeon in Return of the Jedi. You ever think about how uh, oddly specific that torture device is? How many power droids have they gone through? <laughs> and how how needed is a power droid anyway? When when have you ever seen a droid go? Well, I'm powering down. You know what I mean? I, I just can't can't move anymore. It's like the story would has never really necessitated a power droid to come along and help them. So much so that these power droids are just walking around Tatooine, and nobody wants to steal them because they don't really need the power anyway. Uh, they're more interested in farming moisture, I guess. Well, that I can understand. Moisture would be difficult to come across, but powering the things that get you those mo the moisture, those moisture evaporators, I guess it's just not hard to power them. Well, there is a lot of sun, so maybe that's the deal. Oh, There's just solar, solar power. power everywhere with those two suns, and the power droids just... just gonk. Just, they're just sad. Gonk. All right. So now we're going to take a, a, a big leap in time to uh, 2015. So, wait a minute. So we're going from, from like, 1983-84 to 2015. That is a pretty big leap in time. And we're actually going to talk about Disney's Droid Factory. These debuted in the Disney parks in 2012. And uh, at first it was only astromech droids. And you could make your own R2-D2 if you so desire. Now, if these parts seem familiar, that is because these use the tooling that Hasbro had created for their uh, Build-A-Droid lines that include, you know, the Star Wars action figure lines that included little parts of droids that if you got everything across that wave, you could make an actual extra droid out of it and get an extra figure out of it. Um, this is the exact same molds. Hasbro actually lent their molds to Disney to get their line up and running. And if you check, it'll actually still say uh, copyright Hasbro on the parts themselves. I love the recurring theme here that we have of, in the 70s, you have a droid factory, and you could build R2-D2. And in 2015, droid factory, and you could build R2-D2. Interesting note, because the Hasbro build-a-droid concept also covered a lot of expanded universe, the uh, central torso actually has ports for additional legs right at the bottom. So if you wanted... You can make a four-legged R2-D2, which looks really weird. <laughs> but there you go. It's like a Daggett. Yeah. Only not as annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun about this, though, is this was just for the first few years. You'll notice that there are hoses on the two side legs to indicate which is the front. But uh, once Hasbro got their molds back, and Disney started their own tooling, those little hoses went away. 
While these may look pretty identical at first glance, there's actually a lot of differences. Every part of these is unique in some way. Even that little middle leg that would otherwise be pretty standard. Um, but because Disney was thinking ahead on that, the parts are actually interchangeable between these two molds. They kept the peg size the same in case uh, someone who had bought a droid previously wanted to get more parts later. They could still interchange with the droids they already had. Yes, but I, I can't interchange those parts with my 1970s droid factory, so maybe I should shake my fist in anger. Uh, well, you know... <laughs> what? It'll fit. It won't stay, but it'll fit. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just... I'll just fill the, the droid factory with all the block man parts and then build whatever I want. So Disney is not afraid to delve into the expanded universe or the new canon or whatever it's called. I'm a bad Star Wars fan. I'm a bad Star Wars fan too. I'm, I'm mostly about some of the uh, older stuff. Episodes 1 through 6 are for me. I like the other stuff, but uh, I, I just know those older ones better. So you can build yourself an R2. Uh, you can make yourself an R3. R4s and an R5s, right? We've seen those all in the films. If you uh, you know your lore in the background, you know how it goes, which is which is which. But if you're really into the EU, you'd also notice they have R6s and R7s, R8s, and even R9s. So they took those uh, initial Hasbro molds, and they really went in deep in replicating them. They didn't have to make the R6, 7s, 8s, and 9s. They could have done R2s through R5s, and I'm sure people would have been perfectly happy. And it's not just this kiosk of parts. They actually will occasionally make uh, individually carded figures, limited time offering. Halloween, Christmas, they usually have their own droids. I've highlighted those before in our previous episodes. And even occasionally, D23 gets its own special droid. What's nice about the, uh, the special individually carded figures is that sometimes they'll actually have unique parts to them. Like this uh, holiday droid has a, a toque on the top. This particular droid, he's actually got mistletoe. So <laughs> that's fun. And then you've got, you know, one of the Halloween droids that I actually got for you is a uh, glow-in-the-dark one, which R3 is really cool. I kind of regret not buying one for myself, but, you know, I, I left it. <laughs> I missed out. Yeah, he glows so, so well, too. When you buy an astromech at the parks, you actually, you can get a hat for it, too. There are a lot of comical ones. Uh, sombrero. Also, things like an Imperial officer hat. Uh, some of this tooling has gone away, like this Indiana Jones hat you can't get anymore. So that's another layer of compatibility to it. They put out Mickey ears in several different colors. There's like also a, there's a black, there's a green, there's a blue and red that I don't have. So uh, even I'm missing some things. And then uh, they started expanding beyond just Astromech droids, our, our R2, our series droids. Uh, our first one was Chopper from the Star Wars Rebels series. And entirely new mold, this really puts the Hasbro figure to shame because he's got the uh, little articulated arms up top that Hasbro did not. You can swap out the one mismatched leg for a proper C10 leg, which was a story point, a little subplot in one episode. You can even give his middle wheel or even uh, swap that out for his little rocket booster. So this is kind of like an ideal uh, action figure of Chopper. Yeah, it really leaves nothing to be desired, I think. The same thing happened when they eventually started making BB droids. You compare it to that first Hasbro effort, it's, it's no comparison. This one is so much better. It's even like weighted so that it'll always stay upright. Whereas this one is just an empty plastic ball that was flat on the bottom. Sure, he can do the little head rotation that this one cannot, but they kept with the idea of being a build-a-droid and actually have components that can disassemble. It's actually kind of 
fantastic. So beyond individual packs, um, Hasbro has put out various four packs of astromech droids and they actually uh, will keep putting out packs when every new movie comes out. Uh, so they actually put out a pack, four pack for Clone Wars first, then we got a Force Awakens one which actually gave us an R0 which was a droid that was created for Force Awakens. Uh, this was Jess Parva's droid. It's kind of a blink and you miss it astromech variant but we now have an extra head to play with an extra uh, astromech droid type. And when uh, The Last Jedi came out, they gave us a four-pack of BB droids featuring, you know, BB-9E and two other BB droids, which I guess were in The Last Jedi. I don't actually recall seeing them. I know they were in some cartoon shorts that were released around that time. Yeah, I really appreciate that you picked me up a set for, of those as well. They're that set is one of my favorites from there because, like you said, you really can't get the that. They're they're better than the Hasbro quality ones. They're really like Weebles to me. That's what they remind me of. They they play exactly like an old Hasbro Weeble. Earlier Astromech figures came in a black background, and there was a both a one bubble and two bubble version. Uh, currently, they come in these only single bubble options with the blue background. Um, both have number sheets so you can kind of fill in the name tag there with whatever, whatever you want to call it. I have so many of that single card one that uh, I actually use that as like a custom card, figure card now. Because so you can just ch swap out the little cardboard insert and put in whatever you want. You, you actually covered that in an earlier episode when are we we're, we're doing the... Um the Jokon custom figures, the custom class figures, you use some of those cases in order to contain your customs. Yep, we're going full circle with these talks. <laughs> That's right. So in 2017, uh, Disney released more uh, droid figures, but this time they released protocol droids. And uh, I can't tell you how much I actually, I love these, these droids. This is currently Hasbro's uh, Black Series C-3PO. He's a bit on the shorter side, Compare it to their episode 2 3PO and you'll see he's almost, you know, half a head shorter. And it's got some movable panels off of it, which, you know, on paper that sounds great. You can kind of, you know, show the droid inside. In practice, though, you're going to have nightmare fuel most of the time. Because that faceplate does not stay on. But in comparison to the Disney Parks figure... The Disney figure is quite a bit taller, but they have comparable articulation. Now, Hasbro's figures can do that. The Disney ones can't do that, but on a protocol droid, I don't think that's quite so critical to have. It wasn't just a 3PO variant you can make. You can build a Death Star droid. You can build a CZ droid. Or you can build some sort of four-long variant. So they actually made molds for you to do four distinct different protocol droids in there. And uh, it's fun, different colors. You pick a different color for your droid and it might have different accent paint applications on it. The head on this one I've seen, I like to call it a stovepipe head, but it might be called a shopkeeper head. Uh, it seems like it's an original design to me, but there might be some basis in an obscure Star Wars fiction that I haven't read. When these debuted, they actually made a two-pack of C-3PO and R2-D2. Uh, neither of us picked that up because it was meant to be those two as they crashed landed on Tatooine, so there's a lot of like dirt painted on it in Tampagraft, and we just kind of wanted cleaner versions. Um, and it's actually easy enough to swap some parts around and do some light customizing to give yourself a more accurate C-3PO. So if you want to give him, you know, a silver shin and foot or just a silver shin, you can do a little boil and pop and get that going. If you want to give him his uh, Force Awakens look, you give him the red arm and then just kind of paint some gold on the shoulder. So it, it's nice that, you know, you can give yourself some options. Um, this one I even, you know, put a little black on the inside of the hand to just finalize that little detail. Make them look like a uh, finished, detailed C-3PO. Uh, I am... Now, I have this uh, Hasbro C-3PO Episode 2, and you see it's mostly silver and red parts, so with a little weathering I'm sure you could replicate this look. 
Uh, I just looked it up on on the Star Wars wiki, and it says that the shopkeeper droids appeared in the Clone Wars cartoon as well as Clone Wars Adventures, the game. Yeah, I do not remember that in the Clone Wars cartoon at all. Very interesting that they would do such a deep dive that we're having trouble identifying it. That just shows that uh, sometimes they're willing to do the research. All right, here are the generic color options for your uh, droid factory protocol droids. There's silver, gold, white, red, black, and blue. So, uh, theoretically all parts are available in all these colors, though I haven't necessarily seen that play out in the stores. Maybe parts have just uh, sold out. That'll lead us now to a uh, few months back when Galaxy's Edge finally opened. And then we got another new set of droids and another droid factory. Uh, here is the new Disney Parks Droid Factory playset. Uh, it's uh, 50 bucks retail. You'll notice there's a little dunk tank here, another one over here. And the idea is that while it comes with a power droid, which as far as I can tell isn't any different from the power droid that's available in the sand crawler that Disney Parks has, it does offer action features. It's got some lights and sounds. It's got a little uh, moving track pad. But those dunk pads come in when you buy the current four packs. That include more droids, but these are color change droids. In addition to some more generic droids, they actually do have versions of Chopper, BB-8, R2-D2, and C-3PO. You can see some of the color change going on right here. Uh, in warm or cold water, they would change color more fully, but I've got some electrical cords right down here, and I figured having water right next door was probably not a great idea. Yeah, it must be a lot colder where you are, because for me, uh, my R2-D2 is looking like this. My color change R2-D2 right at the moment. Yours is almost red, isn't it? Yeah, he kind of likes to be uh, pretty bright red these days. Yeah, I think that it would have been nice to have been consistent about the cold color is the... The cold or the hot color is the standard, like, known version of the character, and the other one is the color that is just different. But I don't think that's really possible since some colors only work on top of others. Like, it looks like the Death Star droid, which is how I know him, um, most of the figures seem to be standard in their warmer versions, but he actually matches the movie in the colder version. And for a comparison, uh... Here is your standard Droid Factory Death Star Droid versus the color change one. Um, I added a little bit of silver to connect the visors because that's truer to the actual droid in the movies. But beyond that, you can see this is actually a really dark purple. It's not quite black, but it's good enough. I enjoy the set quite a lot. I think that I'm just a sucker for play sets. I think that's that's just a, something that's inherent for me. Anytime I see a play set, it's just a backdrop to make an action figure look all that much better. Um, this this part, it's a little weird how these parts don't really lock together, but to me that just means that eventually they could, could if they wanted to, make other sets that kind of pull up to and sit next to and work, work well with this one. I would love to see an expansion on the Droid Factory buildable figures in a way that you could have a buildable playset that would just get larger and larger. I put it right next here to the vintage um, Jabba's dungeon because I kind of think that they do look neat next to each other. They have some similar features. The Droid Factory has this neat arm, this boom crane arm that moves in and out and uh, attaches to the top of that power droid's head. I just realized while we were sitting here that the vintage uh, Jabba's dungeon that would be the same part on the droid factory actually has a peg coming down off the hook that can hook into the top of the astromech droids that are at Disney Park. 
It's not like a perfect fit, it just kind of fits, but it works. And I'm kind of amazed that I could actually do that and move a droid around um, in, in the old set. This, though, of the modular things, it's definitely a, a dunking a dunking tray. I guess you would fill this with the, either hot water or cold water if you were a kid. But to me, I think it looks like, you know, 3PO is going to enjoy himself an oil bath. Oh, it's going to feel so good. I realize that there's actually a lot of space underneath this, and I, I took like a really large uh, LED light that has like an adjustable slider for how bright it can be, and it's relatively easy to fit it underneath this because this thing actually has a drip tray underneath so that the figures Whenever they're drying, you kind of put them over here, and there's some pretend fans that are actually articulated. They, you can spin them by hand, but there's not like a way to actually make them all spin at the same time. Uh, but there's a drip tray underneath here that matches the same color blue. Well, I realized that if I took this light and put it down here, and then turned the drip tray upside down, Now you have additional light effects, and and I use that particular item to demonstrate this because it's really actually a pretty big light, and that shows how much space there is for these, that you could just kind of light these things up, and it makes them look awesome, and even the fact that that drip tray is blue, it kind of makes it that light match the light that you can, that you can turn on there electronically as you are pretending. I don't know what this is supposed to do. Is that... It's supposed to be, a, it's a conveyor belt of some sort, and it works. Um, not great. It's a little <laughs> stiff, yeah, it but does, it works. Yeah, it does tend to get a little stuck. It has a tendency to stay in the same position that it came in. Uh, once you start to roll it, it's almost like it wants to roll back to that initial spot again. Uh, but it does work. It, it's kind of amazing. The pegs that they made for the feet of the figure are a harder plastic that sticks through the softer rubber of the conveyor belt. So you really can peg a figure on the beginning of it, spin it on through this thing that lights up that I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be pretending that it's doing, whether it's painting the figure or just scanning it. But it, it's a neat little action feature. It rolls on through and it, it's fun. And I do like that there is a, a crane with a peg on top in both of my Droid Factory playsets because it is kind of like a design element through line that connects the past and the future. And, uh, yeah, they, they both serve very different functions. One's about, you know, being creative and creating your own robots. The other's about uh, color change, water, hot and cold. But they're both really fun. They're really nicely detailed. Uh, I, I, too, am a sucker for playsets. I just love that it helps uh, immerse your figures more into the actual world, the environment, you know. Especially something like Star Wars, where you know, going back into your backyard, you can make it a jungle planet, but it doesn't quite work the same as if you were using, like, G.I. Joe's. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the color change feature kind of adds another level of customization among these various droids. So that really seems to be the point to me. Uh, and if you only had a few of them, you know, you could make them hot and cold and swap parts, you know, if... If you could turn parts of him blue and you have other blue parts that could go on him, then it would be look great in blue or look great in, in black, whatever you may choose. I, I think it's just, it is fun and the display of it looks good to me. So uh, I think we've kind of touched on all the big points about this set, um, about these set of toys. Uh, it is worth pointing out again that uh, they are pretty interchangeable with your Hasbro figures, so if you want to mix them all together into one big toy line, it won't look too out of place. Uh, and it's just a fun way of adding some more life and uh, background into your Star Wars sets. Absolutely. I'd love to see um, them continue with the Build-A-Droid theme. Maybe now the Galaxy's Edge is open, maybe a Captain Rex-style robot. You know, if they introduced more types of droids, I think that that really could could help us out a little bit. There definitely were a lot of droids just on Star Tours that have been released in Star Tours that I think would be really cool if they introduced those as builder droid pieces. Um, I don't necessarily see it happening, but 
I'd like it. And before you start asking for people to, for Disney to make an R1 droid, just know that R1 droids look really different from the others. There's actually one at uh, Galaxy's Edge. It's weird how, you know, R2s through 9 have the basic same form, yet an R1 is like twice as tall and is just this weird tube thing. Yeah, I'm not really sure what an R1 droid is, is for. Maybe I am a terrible Star Wars fan. Well, as far as I can tell, it's still an astromech droid. It's just an earlier iteration. Yeah, I just don't know what ship it actually goes into. Maybe there is actually a, a ship established that that I should know the answer to that, but it definitely would stick up pretty high out of the back of an X-Wing, that's for sure. <laughs> and that would never magically fit into the wing of a Jedi starfighter like an R2 unit can. You know, when they did the prequel trilogies and the same types of droids were still present, it really did make you wonder why aren't these companies innovating more droid types. You've spent 20 years and you've got the same <laughs> sets of droids. Well, it was just so perfect. The R2, the R2 units are like a, the perfect droid. So it was him. You had pointed out to me that, uh, that L337 in Solo is actually an astromech droid heavily modified. Yeah. To me, that's interesting. I'd like to see an L337 with uh, parts that are intermingleable with this. It'd be awesome if you could have like parts for L337 as well as parts for like an R2 unit or whatever type of astromech droid she was originally and kind of like the different iterations in between to kind of build a any possible way that she may have looked throughout the history of her modifying herself. I think that would be cool. That uh, would be pretty cool. I'm sure that would involve a lot of parts too. It... <laughs> Her whole haphazard nature of her construction means that there's a lot of things going on in her. One, the other, and then any kind of creative crazy thing in between. So I think that'll bring us to the end of the Droid Factory section and pretty much to the end of our episode. So uh, it's, uh, it's giveaway time. So uh, for this time for getting these uh, Impel sets, all 200 cards, just one winner, uh, I think what we want you to do is follow us on Twitter, uh, send us a little message about what you liked about the episode, and then hashtag it, ImpelGIJoe. Uh, I'll make sure to put our Twitter handle and the hashtag on screen right now so you can see that and copy it. Uh, we'll keep it open for uh, one week after the posting of this video, um, midnight of that day, seven days after if that makes sense. Well, I'll, I'll make sure in the description of the video to give you the cutoff time. That makes sense. Confused me a little bit, but if you put it in the description, it's all going to be good. Yeah, it'll be written out in text. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, that'll do it for this episode. Hope you liked it. Hope you uh, learned something. Uh, what do you think? I think that I hope that people go off and build lots of droids and block men and remember us fondly. And uh, I apologize if I wasn't making sense with my Blockman. I was just so excited to talk about something that I really loved. Like, I, it really takes me back. Um, we went back into the 80s and the 70s with it with, within my brain. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, it, it's great to sit down and talk with you again. Uh, I'm sure that we'll probably follow this up with a few more talking points before we see each other again. But I definitely look forward to next time. All right, me too. Uh... So if you like this episode, uh, give us a like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff, um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching this episode of Articulated Points. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'd appreciate it if you would like, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to learn more about some of the toys featured in this episode or want to follow us on social media, links are in the description below this video.